Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. A quadruplet son. He steals your car, flips you off. Hospitalized eight times. Chase grabbed a hold of his doctor's neck. I just choked him and then gave him a kick. Is his bad behavior? You're calling your father a blanket loser. Being rewarded. Does he lay around on the couch all day? We try to keep getting him to do things. Well, you could take him to dinner. We do stuff like that. I was being sarcastic. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four. I am not giving up on you. Today, we are talking about a young man that seriously had his life going in a way that everybody would want. Amy and Chris say their 19-year-old quadruplet son always wanted to excel at everything he did. He was on the National Honor Society, ran track, held down three summer jobs, but just three days after their son started college, things change. They claim Chase smoked marijuana once for the first time, and he had a severe panic attack. Since then, Amy says Chase has dropped out of college, stolen her car, choked his psychiatrist, and been hospitalized eight times. She says Chase terrorizes the entire family and even posted a nasty message on his social media page accusing his parents of throwing their suffering and mentally unstable son out onto the streets. Now, Chase says his parents are clueless and do not understand the utter mental pain he is going through. Now, you're thinking, one time? Yeah, I believe him. But his father says at this point he believes that only 60% of Chase's issues are mental and the other 40% are overblown exaggeration. Take a look. My 19-year-old son, Chase, was born a happy, healthy child, had a normal life, National Honor Society. Chase is a quadruplet and was the strongest of all four of them. Three days into college, he tried marijuana for the first time and had a severe panic attack. He ended up having to take medical leave from college. And he came home and the panic attacks just became daily. The last year has been the year of hell. When he has a panic attack, he looks different. His pupils dilate and he starts pacing. It is like a, a caged animal. He'll look at me and say, I don't even know who you are. You don't look like yourself and this doesn't look like my house and I don't even know where I am. Chase is terrorizing the whole family. He has caused everybody in the house to feel like they're walking on eggshells. He stole my car and as he was backing out of the driveway, he even gave me the finger. He follows me around the house, calling me and bitch. I think he has rage in him that he should not have. I worry his physical aggression when he's home with my wife. We convinced Chase to see his psychiatrist. He wanted to put him back in the hospital. Chase jumped up and grabbed a hold of his doctor's neck. I just choked him and I was so furious because he was sending me to the hospital. So I gave him a kick, then I stood back and then my dad had tackled me. And I jumped and threw Chase to the ground and sat on him until the police arrived. And then Chase was handcuffed and removed from the psychiatrist's office and taken to the hospital. He was out of control. To agree, I've never seen it before. It scared me. Chase's behavior is getting worse and we don't know what to do. I'm scared for the entire family and I'm scared for him. Okay, guys, I, I'm glad you're here because I want to clear a lot of things up. Is this kind of mysterious to you? Very. I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, I've seen people with anxiety or depression, or what, but not to this severity. Like, it's mm -hmm. out of control, crazy. He's been hospitalized. He's attacked his psychiatrist, tried to choke him, all that. But what's the general upshoot of what they've told you is going on here? Well, at first it started out where he was in his college town. He ended up hospitalized. And right then they said he's just in this high anxiety like a fight or flight. And right. he'll come out of it, he'll probably come out of it, and he'll be fine. 
Well, that was 14 months ago. His eyes are like hugely dilated, yeah, they right? Get, right, you can't let's even take see a, the let's color Let's take a look eyes. at his eyes so we know what we're talking about here. These are his eyes in light. Yes. And they're way dilated, right? Yes. So and you know when he's going to go crazy in a panic mode as soon as I see his eyes get that way. <clears throat> what happens is a drug like marijuana interacts with dopamine and dopamine sensitizes your adrenergic receptors and that can cause you to go into uh, a state of a sympathetic arousal mm -hmm. which is your fight or flight system mm -hmm. and it can cause you to be alert all the time it can cause you to go into that state of arousal all the time and that is what the doctors have been saying but you say 60 percent of chase's issues are mental and 40 percent are exaggerated right I feel that way. Okay. I, I feel like he's dramatized. He wants to bring everybody down with him in the house. Everybody, his biggest support system are his siblings and his parents. Okay, so... And he wants to take us down. What do you do when he out. behaves badly? Well, at one point in time, we threw him out of the house. We, yeah. he, he would not um, stop using the disgusting foul language towards her. And we threatened, we threatened him to, if he continues right. to do that, uh, he would be get, uh, thrown out, the out of the house. The first few times, though, I kind of let it go, meaning I just would say, we don't talk like that. We don't talk like that in our house. And maybe to some people, bad language is no big deal in their house. We don't talk like that in our house. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be talked to like that. <laughs> um, and so I would tell him not to do it. But then there was no, I don't know, punishment for it, but he's 19 years old. He stole your car. He stole my car one night, yes. And you went running out there? Yes, I what, went. He, what he did didn't have his keys because my husband took his keys upstairs to the kid's car that they share. Yeah. And so I said, well, you don't have a car. And he ran in my office, took my keys, and I ran out the front door around him. And I had my cell phone, and he's backing out in the driveway. And I said, I could call the police. Like, don't take my car. I'm mouthing to him. And he flipped me the finger. I, this is not my kid. He never okay, acted like so this Okay, so he steals your car. Yes. Flips you off. Yes. And left. And left. So did you call the police? No, we didn't. Okay, we, but you chased him down. You, you we, went where we he was, went, right? Well, no. We got in the car and drove about halfway there, and he wanted to go and take the car. And then I was, I got nervous because he was in the city, and I didn't want to leave him stranded. I didn't, I know it was wrong. But that's not normally what I do. I don't normally do that. I'm a strict parent. Chase will tell you I'm the strictest parent in the world. But, okay, I, but I now, don't because do. there's something mysterious going on here, right. you started to reward bad behavior. Yes. Yes, because I, that's why I'm here. Tell me, what would you have done? I would if you'd stopped talking. Okay. <laughs> okay. I will. God bless you. <laughs> You can't filibuster your way through this. No, you I'm came not here to get answers, I right? Did. Yes, that's why I'm here. Well, apparently not. You're here to defend what you're doing because you're justifying it, right? No, I, I, well, I'm not justifying it. I want to know here how to again. handle it. Okay, here's the first rule of how to handle it. Mm -hmm. Don't reward bad behavior. Right. Just because you think he has a mental illness doesn't mean that you treat him like it, it, there's, there's something that you, you can't all of a sudden consequate bad behavior. I don't care if he is a florid psychotic. I don't care if he is a blatant schizophrenic. You don't reward bad behavior. Do you think he does not have the ability to learn anymore? No, I know he does, but I think he's we're but, teaching but, him to but, what learn do you the mean, wrong but? way now, right? He, we're teaching him to learn the wrong way now. I mean, to go the other way. Does he have the ability to learn? Yes, he yes. does. Okay, so you've just decided everything you've done in the past, you're going to suspend that and start rewarding bad behavior. Does he lay around on the couch all day? Yeah. Does he whine and complain? Yes, he does. Do you allow that to happen? No, we try to keep getting him to go and, and do things and find things to do, but I don't know how to stop it. Never had mm. this. Well, you could take him to dinner. You could take him well, bowling. Oh, we do stuff like that. He takes him to do stuff all the time. I was being sarcastic. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because that is what you do. Yeah, that's what we do. You're right. Now, Amy and Chris say their 19-year-old son has terrorized the family since he moved back home. Well, we're going to find out what he has to say about that because we're going to meet him next. And there's some interesting posts, some interesting texts, some interesting dialogue. We're going to ask him about all of that. We'll be right back. My mom had threatened to throw me out of the house, and I said, if you throw me out of the house, you're a ass. I was thrown up. I didn't have a choice. They called the cops. I am 
furious with my parents. And later, you're a blanking loser. Oh! You're calling your father a loser? Because he threw me out on the street. And I'm mentally unstable. Chase terrorizes me daily. He constantly is trying to pick fights with me. One night, he came into my bedroom, said F you, and gave me the finger, just out of the blue. He says he's afraid of life and he's afraid of death. My biggest fear is that Chase has crossed the line so much that he'll keep crossing it further and get worse. Chase is very aggressive towards my wife. It makes me very upset. She doesn't deserve to be treated like that. Amy says her 19-year-old quadruplet son, Chase, continues to spiral out of control and terrorizes the entire family. She says she has no idea why Chase is so angry with her and wants to hurt her all the time, even though she allowed him to move back home after he dropped out of college. But Chase says his mother does not understand that his experience with marijuana, just at one time, left him feeling like an alien and he cannot deal with his mental pain. Ever since I had smoked marijuana, I have been completely different. I have to keep moving. I just can't sit still because being in the moment really freaks me out. Objects look weird to me. Humans to me look foreign, like an alien. So you look at me, I look different? I mean, hey, you're good looking, you know. No offense to you, but yeah, humans definitely do look like gross to me. They just look creepy to me. I can't explain it in words. That freaks me out a lot. Well, I think my parents make my condition worse. They just don't understand. When I first like start having a panic attack, my heart like comes out of my chest. That's all I could feel, literally like popping out of my chest. My mom had threatened to throw me out of the house and I said, if you throw me out of the house, you're a ass. I was thrown out. I didn't have a choice. They called the cops. I am furious with my parents. I felt betrayed. It shocks me that I would choke my doctor, but I don't regret choking him. I feel like he deserved more because I don't think anyone should have the power to make someone suffer in a hospital. It's disgusting. It has been a living hell. I feel very foggy constantly. My brain feels like mush. I feel like I don't have control of my life anymore. I'm just completely scared of being alive. Uh, Chase, how you doing this morning? Um, okay, still have a lot of anxiety, but mm -hmm. getting through. Yeah. Does it make you irritable? Uh, yeah, definitely. And you vent where? You vent that anger where? Um, towards my parents. What did they do? Um, did, they, did they cause your anxiety? Uh, no, but, um, I think they make my condition worse. How's that? Um, they've just always been like really overprotective. They would track us on our GPS uh, all the time. And we're good kids. We never did drugs before. We always did fantastic in school. And we were always treated like we were bad kids. Well, how is that antecedent to your anxiety, though? Um, you, you did marijuana, right? Yes. They didn't smoke the dope. You did. Yeah. And you didn't have anxiety before you smoked the dope. No. So it seems like the trigger to the anxiety was smoking the dope. Mm hmm And who did that? I did. So why are you blaming them? Um, because they just restrict me, like, while I'm going through all this. You said in your tape piece that when you were talking about your anxiety, you said, and I quote, my heart is literally popping out of my chest. Yeah. That's all I feel. Yeah. But that's not really happening. Yeah, no, no. But that's what it literally feels like that, though. But, see, that's what we call catastrophizing. Okay. We use language sometimes that is catastrophizing, where we say, my heart is literally popping out of my chest, which mm -hmm. would mean it would be on the floor, and we'd need to pick it up and put it back in there. And yeah. you say, well, I don't mean that literally. Well, then yeah. don't say that. So one of the things you got to do is, is rein your language in. You got to be sure that you're 
not catastrophizing things in your own mind, because uh, you don't need to do that to get the point across to me, because I understand what you're saying, that this is paralyzing to you. It makes it where it's difficult for you to engage in almost any constructive activity, right? Yeah. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to look at some things that you're saying to other people and ask you how you feel about the power of those words. We'll be right back. Here is the chief. He let his controlling, judgmental, crazy bitch wife, Amy, throw their suffering and mentally unstable son on the streets. After everything we do. And later. Well, and you can't accept the fact you need to be in the hospital. Chase, your behavior you get... was over the top. You have no freaking clue what a hospital is like. You have no clue. In my town, I'm the police chief. I'm well respected in the community. I'm charged with keeping the peace and keeping order for our town. I can't even keep peace and order in my own house. He tries to tell me that we were too strict of parents, and that's why he's like he is right now. Even though my dad's a cop, my mom is definitely way stricter than him. My mom makes all the rules in the house. My dad just totally lets my mom control everything. One of these days, I want my dad to stand up for what's been going on with my mother. When, when you say you have no respect for your father, wh why? Um, well, it just pisses me off that he just lets it happen. How is that any of your business? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. There's apparently somebody out there who does that with her husband. <laughs> no, seriously, how is that in you? Because, I mean, I've got two boys, mm -hmm. uh, and what goes on between my wife and I is damn sure none of their business. Yeah. I'm just well, wondering. Well, you asked me, so I just said, No, I'm saying, well, I'm, okay. now I'm asking you, how is that any of your business? What goes on between them as a couple? I guess it's not, but you asked me. Well, let's look at some of the text messages um, between Chris and Chase concerning Amy. On October 4th, 2017, Chris says, sorry, we disagree. I didn't want the fight. Uh, you didn't stop mom. Shame on you. You let your overprotective wife control you. Chris says, let's just start over, come home. Chase says, you left me on the blanking street. Chris says, come home. Chase, no. Chris, I guess I didn't do enough. Chase, bye. Hope you feel good about yourself, chief. Now, let's look the same day between you and your mother. October 4th again. Chase, you put me out on the street. Amy, no, you just had to stop cursing at me. That's all. I didn't even ask you for an apology. I just wanted you to stop. I'm here for you always. Chase, I said I'd only curse at you if you disrespected me. You did, so I did. You weren't there for me two blanking days ago. Get over it, Amy. Blank is just a blanking word. After everything we do, you threw a mentally unstable kid out on the streets. Right. Yeah. Yes, they did. Well, October 4th, 2017, you posted this. I'm completely suffering. I'm homeless. I got kicked out of my house two nights ago. I've been suffering every single second since I smoked that pot over a year ago. I feel like I'm floating out of my body. Please pray for me. Um, and that's who they kicked out, right? That, that's You're saying that's the yeah. condition I'm in. And... Then the next day you said, hey, here is the chief. He let his controlling, judgmental, crazy bitch wife, Amy, throw their suffering and mentally unstable son on the streets. Give a big blank, you, to the two of them. What was your objective in posting that? I just wanted to hurt him because he hurt me. So you wanted to inflict pain? Yeah. And then here are some text messages between father and son about not living at home. Chris, I hope everything is good. Love, Dad. Chase, of course it's not going well. Chris, I want to help. Chase, you can help me. Dad, how? 
Chase, uh, but I'm not living in your blanking house, Chris. Come home. You can. Chase, no, you're a blanking loser. <gasps> um, you're calling your father a loser? Because he threw me out on the streets. And I'm mentally unstable. Well, we're going to take a break and meet Chase's brother and find out why he says Chase is using his issues to manipulate their parents. We'll be right back. Chase disrespects and terrorizes his own family. It just hurts me to see my parents who have given everything that they can to our family and then they're being treated by their son like this. It's awful. I'm fed up with my younger brother and his destructive behavior. Closed captioning provided by... We were in a car with my son Trey in the front seat. Chase was in the back seat. Chase asked me, where the f are we going? And Trey said, stop using that language. Chase hit him across the side of the head very hard. I do not regret slapping him across the face. Trey accused Chase of faking his illness, and that angered Chase, and he continued to physically attack my son Trey. He hit him several times. Chase grabbed Trey's hair out of his head and destroyed his shirt. The physical fight between my brother and me, I blame the illness and not myself. Well, that was Chase's father, Chris, who is a police chief, talking about how Chase attacked one of his quadruplet brothers. Now, Chase says his family does not understand that he has no control over his thoughts or actions. His brother, Blaze, says when he initially heard about Chase's mental breakdown, he questioned if it was real or if Chase was looking for an excuse to leave school and just didn't want to say it. I'm fed up with my younger brother Chase and his destructive behavior. Chase disrespects and terrorizes his own family. Chase makes me angry when he does this because I know deep down that he can have the motivation to try to move his life forward. I believe that it's 60% behavioral, 40% psychological. The behavioral aspect of it is taking over and he's showing his stubbornness, his wanting to control every situation, and he's using his experience to somewhat control my parents' lives and to terrorize them. It just hurts me to see my parents who have given everything that they can to our family and then they're being treated by their son like this. It's awful. Chase will destroy our family if he doesn't change. Okay, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, you think some of this is manipulation? Absolutely. Okay, you don't disagree that he is experiencing some discomfort? Correct. You don't think he's just totally fabricated this out of the blue? No, absolutely not. There's clearly, since the beginning, you know, I went to the hospital when he was first in the hospital at school, and, you know, to see him come out of the room, um, out of the back room of the hospital, it was like I was, wasn't my brother. It was, it was terrible to see him like that. But mm -hmm. in the last two or three months, there's been signs of him definitely, I can see it, of him coming back into his normal personality. And now it's to the point where I think he feels like he's able to control the two of them because, quite frankly, they're afraid to lose their son. They're afraid of their son taking off on, on them. And that, that's hard for me to watch. At the same time, uh, you know, they clearly have allowed him to treat them like this and um, you know it's unacceptable on both sides. You look at the medical history here, he's been hospitalized eight times. Here are the diagnoses. Major depressive disorder, other specified obsessive compulsive disorder, unspecified depressive disorder, rule out unspecified schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorder, existential obsessive thoughts, atypical psychosis, visual distortions, major depressive disorder with recurrent episodes of psychotic features, unspecified anxiety disorder, psychotic disorder, unspecified. There are some real key terms here when you look at it, like other specified, unspecified, rule out unspecified, uh, atypical, which means we don't really know what it is, um, <laughs> and then down here, unspecified, unspecified, which means we don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> That's how we feel. And since we don't know, Let's just throw a bunch of pills at it and see what happens. And we trusted the doctors. We trusted well, them. Well, of course and, you do. That, you have no choice. Questioned. I mean, that's what, that's what happens. And I'm sorry that's happened to you. 
forget Dr. Phil, dad to dad, you want to help your boy. Yes, I do. And you don't know how to do that. And the good news is it's just over your pay grade. When we come back, I think this is going to get real clear real fast. We'll be right back. Closed captioning provided by... Chase has attacked me on social media during his outburst. He took a picture of my husband and he put on social media underneath it that this is the chief of police of the town we live in and that his controlling bitch wife kicked out their mentally ill son and for everybody to give a big you to them. The whole town has heard and knows about what my son has said on social media. It's been very embarrassing for me. The, these post things that, that he put online, it made me very, very angry. But to have your own brother, who was brought up by these two, who have given everything that they can to try to give him a good life, and for him to just be so disrespectful in a public forum is disgusting. I do not regret the posts that I have posted. I sent that out because I felt like they deserved it. Look, I've given you one concept already, and the concept is you do not reward bad behavior. Now, here's another concept I want you to wrap your head around. The irresistible impulse and the impulse not resisted. Now, that's a big difference. The irresistible impulse is something you just have no ability to resist. It just takes over and you become a passenger. Versus an impulse that you just choose not to resist. So when you look at things that Chase does that he should not do, you would have a pretty good list, right? One would be a uh, curse at his parents, right? Yes. Another would be to uh, become violent, like attacking your caregivers. I, I think you should not, uh, not, not disrespect his uh, siblings who have uh, been there for him um, and the rest of the family. Okay. Um, disrespecting... Um, I have terrible writing, by the way. Disrespecting siblings. How about um, stealing a car? Yes. Taking everybody down, like with the social media. Public disrespect. Yes. Okay. Just laying around and not doing anything and just marinating in okay. his thoughts. Okay. Just being a layabout. Yeah. Okay, give me a few examples of things he doesn't do that he should do. Exercise, he's always been a runner. Okay. He probably should get a job at this point. Okay. He's not gonna go back to college right away. Um, he could certainly help uh, around the house. Okay, what else does he doesn't do that he should do? Well, his therapists have given him a lot of homework and he doesn't want to do it. Okay. You should respect the people that help him the most. Uh-huh. I think he needs to be more um, independent. Hold self accountable. Yes. You know, good. own his situation. He needs to be more He's remorseful. Not remorseful for his actions. Anything, when he does yeah. something, he, does, he doesn't think it's wrong. Or he... Yeah, and uh, I, I'm changing your words a little bit, but uh, I, I'm going to expand that to say empathy. Um, just to have empathy for his impact on other people. Uh, is this an irresistible impulse or an impulse not resisted? Impulse not resisted. Yeah, I, I think there's no question mm -hmm. this is an impulse not resisted because he hasn't done it today. That's right. He attacked his psychiatrist. He hasn't attacked me. I was worried about that. <laughs> I would never attack you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he disrespects his siblings. Irresistible impulse or impulse not resisted? Impulse not resisted. Stealing the car? Irresistible impulse or impulse not resisted? Not resisted. Not resisted. Okay. So 
not resisted. Virtually everything you talked about is a choice. Like with the psychiatrist thing, there was a reason. I mean, the reason why I choked him is because he forcefully put me in the hospital. And but he went to school and you didn't. <laughs> oh, the, he did. He, but he was never hospitalized. You have no freaking clue what a hospital is like living there for 150 days. You have no clue. But I trust with somebody who's gone to school and so has, school seen, mean has seen cases like yours. And he's he felt, clueless. He doesn't even know what's going he, on with me. And he felt that it was necessary to put you in the hospital. Because yeah. I was and crying you can't at his office. And you can't accept the fact that maybe that you had an issue that you needed to be in the hospital. Chase, your behavior you was get, over the top. And that's you what help. he noticed. What, what was right over, over the top? What was over the top? You're a little look manic. The, look at the list. That day. Cursing, violence. Cursing when they disrespected you were, you're me. You were a little manic that day and you were, you were the day before that. I mean, he saw some of those postings as well. I want to add to the conversation Dr. Frank Lawless. Dr. Lawless, I think what needs to happen here is that we need to do a scan of your brain. And what we're going to find is some areas are going to be very dark, that should be very light, should be a lot of activity there, and some of them are going to be very hot when they should not be. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lawless, I'll turn this over to you. We also might have a feature of PTSD, and he can't remember any of the events about that, but he might have been uh, highly anxious in the situation that he was in. So we need to look at that. Mm -hmm. And then we also need to consider the fact that he's got some um, issues of what we call reflexive fighting response. And that is when you're anxious and feel out of control, you attack anybody that's around. Right. And you say that there are CB1 receptors that are widespread in the brain, right? And we're talking about the amygdala, which regulates the emotions. And we're talking about fear and anxiety. And the active component in marijuana, the THC, affects that in terms of panic and, and paranoia. And so it cuts across the entire brain. And all of this is affected when somebody has an ab reaction to it. And Dr. Lawless, you're talking about doing neurotherapy, some sonic therapies. There are some things that can happen that can change this in very short order, correct? Absolutely, and we will probably be adding to those kinds of healing brain techniques that work very quickly and will help uh, resolve him back to uh, where he was before. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Makes sense. Okay. Uh -oh. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, so thank you, Dr. Lawless, and everyone at the PNP Center thank for offering to help Chase. Okay? Got a plan? You good? <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my next guest has a secret habit that he hid from everyone for 16 years, including his doctor. We'll meet him next. captioning provided by if you've ever smoked cigarettes and tried to quit you know how incredibly tough it is to break the habit and that's really not breaking and we're going to talk about that but what happens if you're a secret smoker and you keep your habit hidden even from your own doctor well that's exactly what my next guest Wendell did not only did he keep his smoking from his doctor he kept it from his family and friends for 16 years. Take a look. I started smoking seriously when I was a freshman in college. I thought it was cool. <laughs> but my smoking went from a casual habit to an addiction. I tried to keep my smoking a secret from my wife. As soon as I came home, 
take a shower and nice cologne, change my clothes. I always had mint, so gum on hand, and I felt embarrassed, shame, and guilt. In 2003, I had a serious health scare. I was worried I would have it with cigarettes, but thinking of a life without ever smoking a cigarette again, I was not mentally prepared to quit smoking. Well, that's because he had a lot of momentum going. Uh, Wendell is joining me along with our very good friend and chief medical officer of Pfizer, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Now, Wendell, how in the world did you keep this secret for so long and why? Well, I kept it a secret because I grew up in a non-smoking family. Then why did you even start? I thought it was cool. And also I had some friends in high school who smoked it. Next thing you know, I'm a full-time smoker. Dr. Frieda, how common is it for someone like Wendell to keep smoking a secret, particularly from their doctor? A study of current and former smokers found that about one in 10 people who smoke do not tell their doctors. Now this would equate to about four million people in the U.S. that don't tell. Wow. But we all know how bad smoking is for health, obviously, so why would anybody not mm -hmm. tell their doctor? Smoking causes one out of every five deaths in the United States. Still today. Smoking harms nearly every organ in your body. Smokers are more likely to develop heart disease, stroke, and lung cancer than non-smokers. On average, smokers die more than 10 years earlier than non-smokers. So even with all of this knowledge about the health risks, many people say they don't tell their doctors because they feel guilty, they feel ashamed, because they're not ready to quit yet. And some say, you know, I just don't want to hear a lecture about it. And many times mm. people say, well, you know, I, didn't, I don't tell my doctor because my doctor just doesn't ask. Well, are there other reasons keeping a secret from your doctor can be dangerous? So in addition to all of these health risks, there are many things about the risks of smoking that people just don't know. Like, smoking can interact with certain medications, like anesthesia, for example, which is why it was such a good thing that Wendell told his doctor before the surgery. Another example, women who smoke and take oral contraceptives, especially those that are 35 years or older, may be an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So it is important to tell your doctor if you're a smoker because it's essential to safe and effective care. And nearly 70% of people who smoke want to quit. Many just don't know how to get started. Nicotine addiction has physical, mental, and social components. And it may take many attempts in order to really quit for good. And I want to make sure this doesn't mean, oh, there's a lack of willpower involved. This is difficult because smokers are fighting an addiction. What does it show is the best way for a smoker to finally stop? So, first of all, fess up to your doctor. Your physician may be able to help you put a quit plan together. They can use their expertise and support to uh, find the right path for you. And that it may include counseling and medication in combination that would double your chances of quitting. And it's also important to set a quit date, to have a, a goal that you can then have a plan to work towards the day that you'll be smoke free. And then to also think about what those smoking triggers are and to find ways to avoid them. And I've found also that it is so important to seek support. Tell your family, tell your coworkers, tell your friends to support and motivate you to increase your success rate. Program yourself for success. I mean, your body's physiology starts to improve right away. Within 20 minutes after quitting, your heart rate and your blood pressure start to drop. In 12 hours, the carbon monoxide levels in your blood normalize. At one year, your risk of a heart attack drops. At five years, your risk of a stroke declines. And at 10 years, the risk of someone who has quit smoking to develop lung cancer is half of that of someone who is still smoking. Wow. So there are immediate benefits and long-term benefits in stopping. Wow.
So, Wendell, how'd you finally quit? I was working at a hospital where they offered the American Lung Association's Freedom from Smoking program. Yeah. So I was able to take that program, and I've been smoke-free for 10 years now. 10 years. Now, Pfizer and the American Lung Association provide uh, support at quitterscircle.com. And there you'll find resources and tips and a support community of people who are going through uh, the quit journey and can go uh, with you. Yeah, and you got to go to my favorite, which is gethealthystayhealthy.com to find out the best ways to design that quit plan that's right for you. And you'll always find a wealth of information on all kinds of health-related issues on that website. I love that website. And, of course, while you're there, you can sign up for the monthly newsletter uh, where you can get health-related information sent to your inbox. Yeah. I want to thank all of my guests today, especially Dr. Frieda Lewis-Hall. Do you have an issue or problem in your life that you would like my help? I'm here and I want to hear from you. Just go to drphil.com and you can email me or if you'd like to join us here in the audience, Robin and I would love to see you here. The tickets are free. Get all the information right on the website. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and check us out on Facebook, too. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.